excited to be here and share with you this very serious and important topic. For those of you who have seen me, I'm very passionate about this work, having been adopted at the age of seven and a half, and I was raised in foster care for six years. So I'm going to teach you the tools, give you a nice foundation, and give you the words and wording so that you have your script, per se, and you will find your own natural flow in how you give your child their story because they do learn what happened to their birth family and what the circumstances were at that time. I'm gonna teach you how to separate out their story from them so children don't walk around what I call with the cloak of shame. I'm adopted or I'm a foster kid and there's something wrong about me, that there's a condition. I'm very big on separating the child from their history so they can be a person first and have their story with them and they can make sense of what happened for them. Oh, and when do I tell a child their story? And a lot of my PowerPoints I put in the perspective of the parent perspective <laughs> and the child's point of view. So you wanna tell your child as soon as possible, as early as possible, as soon as you are educated, as soon as you have the resources, books, interventions, that you will want to support your child's story with age appropriate. Why do we tell their story? To mitigate a child from experiencing shame and rejection. If kids are not told their story, they're going to, guess what? Make up their story. And their story is going to be a negative construct of what happened. Because why? The brain research is our brains are in Velcro for negative experiences. So a child will tell themselves the worst case scenario of what happened to their birth family if no one tells them. I told myself two things. I have a birthmark on my leg. No one told me anything. I told myself it's because of this birthmark that they didn't want me. So I told myself, I had terrible self-esteem growing up. And I'm getting emotional because this is a lifelong process. I had to sit with that for years, years. So children need to know it wasn't about them. It was about circumstances. Because children are egocentric. They will believe in their hearts that they were rejected and that it was their fault that they are no longer with their birth family. Yet the reason they are no longer with their birth family is never their fault. They did not do anything especially bad to make this happen because babies aren't that powerful. So the child's needs. Children have a connection to their birth parents that begins even before birth that cannot be changed, denied, by legal documents. Children need information about their origins to help form a personal identity. And research shows that they thrive by having this information. It doesn't hurt them. It's not traumatizing. I want to differentiate that for people because there's a lot of talk about, am I going to traumatize my child? You are not going to traumatize your child with their story. You're going to tell it to them age appropriate. What mitigates trauma is preparation and processing. What mitigates trauma is someone talking with, joining with, explaining with, tolerating big feelings with, that allows the child to understand, grieve, make sense, and move on and not move on completely because we're never fully healed. We are always healing, but they can begin to have a greater sense of who am I, where do I come from and who do I wanna be in the world? Because a lot of kids get stuck in the past if they don't know what happened. They're always trying to figure it out and make sense for themselves. So we want to, honor that internal process for them and help them make sense of this disorganization. Because as some kids, they've been through multiple placements. 
not just separated from their birth family, but they have, may have been in one foster home, two foster homes, or three foster homes. I've worked with kids as many as 10 foster homes. So think about how much they're holding on to, all these experiences that they're trying to make sense of. Children do also need to know that their birth families cared about them and that the foster placement or adoption didn't represent rejection. Now, this can be tricky. And here's what I wanna say also. Generally, every person's story is different. You will need to fine tune details. There are general ways of explaining things. But as the child gets older, you will be more specific and identifying details that are specific to that child's story. But children do need to be told their story over and over and over again at each new stage of development because the story will be recycled mentally and emotionally differently each time. So you are supporting their emotional needs the child's point of view. I need help in recognizing my foster placement and or adoption loss and grieve it. If I don't grieve my loss, my ability to receive love from you and others will be hindered. I need to be reassured that my birth parents' decision not to parent me had nothing to do with anything defective in me. I need help in learning that absence doesn't mean abandonment. There's a good reason why I'm not with my birth family and I need to know why. I need permission to express all my foster placement and adoptive feelings and fantasies. You are supporting their validation needs. I need validation of my dual heritage. I have a biological heritage and an adoptive heritage and even a foster heritage. So I was raised in a Jewish foster home then I was adopted into a Jewish foster home. And then I learned that I, my birth family was Roman Catholic. So for me, it was like, oh, I didn't know, but I didn't learn this till I was an adolescent. I was 17. I wish I could have known parts of my story. And I also didn't know my birth mother was native Argentinian till I was 17. I needed to know these things earlier so that it would have helped my identity development and helped me make sense of, oh, that's why I can salsa really good. I didn't know where I got this from and certain pieces of who I am genetically. So the child's point of view, I need to be assured that often that I am welcome and worthy. And I'm gonna say something about this. I do run a support group in Los Angeles. It's actually on Zoom now. And you're all welcome, parents are welcome. If you go to Celia Center, C-E-L-I-A, center.org. That's my birth mother's name. I started a nonprofit to support the community here in Los Angeles because there's so much need. What I say in the support group is you can tell a child over and over and over, they're valuable, they're worthy, they matter, but there's a part of them that doesn't feel valuable worthy. And what happens is it goes in one ear and it goes out a shoot, literally. It doesn't stick. However, I need to be assured often. And you may think, I've already told her 10 times she's important, she's valuable, or he matters. We need to hear it over and over because it's that egocentric part of there must have been something wrong with me because how could any any mother or father give away their baby. There must be something wrong about me. Children will take it personally. I need your validation that I have suffered a profound loss before I came to you and you are not responsible. And it's really hard. And I have a lot of empathy for parents, foster, adoptive, kinship families. It is really hard because we want to fix that pain and we can't. It's not that we won't, we can't. That's the child's grief and loss. And they need to be with other adoptees or foster youth like themselves. They need to see other families like themselves. They need to see even adult adoptees, mentors. Kids need to see adults who are, oh, she's okay, I'm gonna be okay. They need that validation of, 
I'm okay and I'm gonna get through this. Yes, it's gonna be hard, but I need community. I need to be reminded often by my foster or adoptive family that they delight in my biological differences and appreciate my birth family's unique contribution to our family tree through me. Now I know because I've worked closely with DCFS, I was also, also a foster care social worker in LA County, working, traveling to kids' homes. I know the horrendous, horrendous, scary things that parents do to their children. And if we really step back and just think that had they had good parenting, support, financial support, emotional support, psychological support that may have mitigated them from doing these very scary things to their children. Not that we are excusing that behavior, we're explaining that behavior, but all people without the proper resources and support, not everyone can parent. We need to find something, something, about the birth family for that child to hold on to. That's not all negative, a perception of there's something bad about your birth family. We need to mitigate that factor and find something. Finding out what the birth mother did for a living, what her creativity was, what the father's upbringing was, what sport he was good at. Maybe he's in a gang today, but if we could find out anything anything that plants that seed of resilience because if we project that the birth parents are bad the child is going to eternalize themselves as bad mm -hmm. they feel that connected so we need to be really careful let's see what we can find if it's culturally they're mexican let's let's embrace being mexican and that culture for them if that's what it is then let's immerse them in their culture something from their heritage that supports them. You are supporting their educational needs. I need to be taught that foster care and adoption is both wonderful and painful, presenting lifelong challenges for everyone involved. I need to know my foster care and or adoption story first, and then my birth story and birth family story. So helping them understand how you formed as a family. Now, some kids are older, so they'll know. Younger kids are not. That's where life books come in. Our adoption story. Life books are very, very, very important. So do that first. Then you're going to start the process of helping them make sense of their birth family story. I need to be taught healthy ways for getting my special needs met. And you are supporting their relational and spiritual needs. I need friendships with other children who are also in foster care and or adoptees. I need to be taught that my life narrative began before I was born and that my life is not a mistake. I need to be taught that loving families are formed through foster care and adoption as well as birth. I would not be sitting here without my foster family for six years, my adoptive family who adopted me at seven and a half. I am thankful that I received the support that I needed. And I entered therapy when I was 13 because I was having significant mental health challenges because my parents didn't have a training like this. Uh, but you do, so it's now your responsibility to do this for your child. Eight plus one principles of telling their story. This comes from telling the truth to your adopted and foster child book. Use positive adoption language, which I'm gonna go over. Don't try to fix the pain of adoption. It's a part of them, it's not all of them. Have perspective, but it could be a really big part. Get comfortable with initiating the conversation. Get comfortable. It's gonna be hard at first. You may sweat a little bit. You may, your heart may race a little bit. Embrace that feeling, tolerate that feeling, and you'll get through it. And I'm gonna show you some great books and I have lists of books for you. Books are a really great way to initiate the conversation because it gives you the language. Because a lot of this experience is pre-verbal. 
which means it happened before roughly the age of three. We didn't have words. Children don't have words for the experience. It's hard to explain. We want to have bibliography, books that help the child make sense through words. Don't lie to a child about the past or a birth family member. Share information in developmental age appropriate ways. I'm going to go through each age group. Omissions are okay until age 12. Then by adolescence, all information is best to be shared. If you take this training and you're like, okay, I'm ready, but then you're feeling stuck, it's okay to talk to a, an adoption competent professional and go, I just need advice how to explain this because this is a tough one. Some situations are very difficult. What age cognitively is the child? Most children who've experienced trauma, that's either separation trauma or multiple placements trauma. There's a tool, there's an assessment tool. You just step back, you have a new child in your home and you look at them when they're having their big, big feelings and you step back and go, hmm, what age am I seeing? That's going to tell, give you information. Wow, I'm really seeing a three-year-old. And if you look at their history, you can even see at the age of three, probably that's around the age where their trauma was. So we need to think, oh, nine-year-old, he can be told the nine-year-old part that Jeanette's saying, mm, actually, no. They may, you may need to go back younger and go, I need to approach him from a three to five-year-old because he can't make sense cognitively. He's not developmentally on track yet. So you, there's a lot to assess here as to what you tell. So if you don't know, consult with a professional to get some support and advice. Allow anger to be expressed towards a birth family member without joining in. Children have a right to be angry. I was extremely angry. Children sometimes don't have any emotion. They don't know what to feel and that's okay. Every child will react differently. And number one, so we're all adults here, we must take responsibility over our own reactivity. And that doesn't mean that you're not going to have feelings. You're going to have feelings too. Hopefully you have a support group to go to share your feelings. Yes, I shared my story after coming to this training and it was scary, but we all felt a sense of relief. It was scary. We did it. We braved it. And my child now, what we tend to see is they're less symptomatic behaviorally because they have a knowing. Kids need to know these things because just because they're not actively talking about it does not mean they're not actively thinking about it. It's like we're, we're and I say we, cause I was one of those kids. We're walking around with puzzle pieces above our heads. Some of the pieces have pictures on it and some of them are completely destroyed. We don't know where they belong. And then we're like, okay, go to school and do receptive learning now. <laughs> and we have all of this information that we're carrying that we can't organize and make sense. And you wonder why kids have ADHD. They're carrying so much information. They don't know what to do with it. It's a lot to contain for a child. So having someone as an adult therapist, social worker, helping them make sense, organize this for them, just gives them that sense of, ah, now I can read a book, right? I don't have to think about all this now because now it's out here and someone's helping me with this. Consider asking questions instead of telling, what do you remember? Do you have any questions? Do you wonder about different things? If the child refuses or resists the conversation, they are not ready, they are not ready, try again later, try again later. Ask permission first before relaying information so they feel a sense of mastery and control. A lot of kids, we assume, never assume with kids. We stay curious. Children need preparation. We also want to be mindful of when we're giving the information. I tell parents the summer's a great time because it gives them a lot of downtime to be with you, to ask questions, to draw pictures. So having a lot of downtime is when I usually tell parents, you start doing some interventions and you start relaying information to them that they're ready for and that they're asking for.